did we introduce ourselves? I don't know that we did. We did we probably not. Should. Um, I'm I'm Harley Moore. <laughs> See, we didn't know who did who was going on who was on first there for a second. <laughs> I'm Harley Moore. I'm one of the um, people with Meta Solutions. I've known you guys a lot of you guys for a long time. I've been here for 14 years, um, working in in Power School, so I feel very comfortable with the product. And Laura Cox is here as well. She's been in well, probably as long as I have into Power School, working in Power School, as well as we have Sally Ruddick, um, who's been here for a couple of years now, doing really well and and uh, ready to take on actually doing a lot of our trainings. So Sally will be doing some of these trainings. You'll see her actually starting on Office Functions, probably the next go round of Office Functions trainings that we have. So the three of us are here to go over enrollments and transfers. Laura mentioned that, you know, if we just went over how to enroll a student, honestly, it would take five minutes. Your class time would be five minutes. What we try to do is give you a really good look at all the things that are needed for enrolling a student into school, not just getting them and their name in the system, so to speak. Um, so we're using that checklist again that uh, Laura alluded to. So hopefully everybody mm -hmm. has the checklist and access to the checklist as well. Laura's going to step us through enrolling some yeah. kiddos. I kind of want to add too that I know a, a great many of our districts have went to a third party vendor for registration and the student or the parents go online and fill out all the forms and then you you know, can push it into power school. We don't go over that in this training. You know, that's all things that you would get from your third party vendor. What we are doing is how you would do it in core power school. Um, the steps that are needed if you are manually entering. Um, vast majority of you, yeah, if you're using a third party vendor, they're coming in through the system, you know, through your system. But there's times that, you know, you have that student that is, in your district, but open enrolling to the neighboring school, you know, that parent's not going to fill out your paperwork probably because they're not attending your school. So there are times when you still are going to have to manually enter some students. So as far as enrolling them and then the transferring out process, of course, is, is what we'll go over at the end. All righty. So I'm going to get my enrollment checklist here. Enrolling a new student. So as Harley mentioned, it, putting the kid in there just takes a couple minutes, but it's just all of that additional information you need to add. So I'm going to go to school enrollment, and then I'm going to go to enroll new student. This is the basic shell of information that's needed for your students. So I'm going to go ahead and enter a last name and you're going to want to, you know, pull this off of your um, birth certificates so that it pulls um, and goes to, to find the SSIDs. That's all part of that. So be sure you're using what's on the birth certificate. So if I, as you notice, I just typed in an L and it gave me this check for duplicate students. We always need to be sure that that student isn't already in there. He may have been, I'm at the high school. He, oops, that's the other thing. You have to be in the building. I'm so glad I glanced over there. I can't do this in the district office. I must be in the building when you enroll a student. I forgot I jumped out of there. Okay, and I'm going to last year because that's where our data is. Sorry, school enrollment. Enroll new student. All right, so ba back to where I was. So once I type in a letter, it's gonna, if it starts seeing a match, you know, first name, last name, those types of information, it's gonna come up here and give you this du duplicate student list. We really have to be careful. We don't bring in a enter, I guess I wanna say, enter a new student that's already in our system. Um, I'm at the high school. He may have been here when he was in the elementary building and he's, he transferred out. So he's still kind of hanging in that elementary building until I go and move him. So in this case, I can look and see and if the student I want to enter is here. 
And I can see it's nice. I can see check date of birth, gender, all of that things, all those, I guess, different items to verify that that's the student I want. And I can see their status. So right now I can see if this was the student, Adam Lee, he's still in the high school, but he's in a transferred out state. So if that's my student, I'm going to go find him and I'm going to re-enroll him into school. If he was in a different building, maybe it's Aiden Lee and he's now a ninth grader. Well, I'm going to have to either go to the elementary school three or contact that person and ask them to transfer that student to me at the high school. Then I can get a hold of him and re-enroll him. Okay, so you always want to double check that the student is not already there. You notice there's 155 additional students to look at as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. And as I type that. more info in, it would keep right. narrowing that list down. It does. Okay, so I'm going to put in a person. Last name's Ham. First name is Sharon. And then their middle name. You want all of that information, as I said earlier, that comes from the birth certificate. What goes Data in there birth. if there's no middle name? Anybody know? Anybody know? What goes in there if there's no middle name? I just leave it blank. Oh, good job. I'm not sure who said there that. There we go. Yep. yep. Asterisk. Okay. Date of birth. Once again, you know, you're getting all of this from the, the, um, Oops, I don't want to do the 23rd of 23. I don't even know how far back. We're just going to make up a date. Gender. Student number. Do not fill in student number. It's best to leave it blank. The system's going to assign the student number. So it knows what's the last student number you used that was or was used, and it's going to give it the next one. So the best... Um, Thing to do here is to leave that blank. We don't want to duplicate a student number either. Social security number, that's on here, but I, I'm not sure if we have any districts any longer that collect that. You can leave that blank. Phone number. After that. Enrollment date. Enrollment date is not the day that you're entering this information. It's not the date they filled out the paperwork. It is the first day that that student will be sitting in the class. Harley likes to use the button seat. That's the day that they're going to start. So I'm going to, just so we can see them, I'm going to say that they started yesterday. Full-time equivalency. Notice the asterisk. This is very important. Please fill this in. Make sure you choose something here, because if you do not, that student will not enroll and you'll lose all the data you've already entered. So you must pick a full-time equivalency. Grade level, what grade are they going to be in? Entry code. Now these are, I'm gonna think most of you probably know, most common one is the number six. They're coming from another public school but they may be coming from out of state or from homeschooling. You know, you'll pick the appropriate choice. Tracks, if you use tracks, which I think a majority of our schools do anymore. Tracks, remember, are a, an attendance, used for attendance. So everyone who's on track A may be here the entire school year, every day. But track B, maybe my seniors are on track B because they don't come those last three days. So it's a way to group students and show on the calendar the days that they are to be in session. District of residence. Very important. This is where they live, not necessarily your school. If I don't know, I can always, I mean, I can, I guess I will know, but I can come over here and find them as well and choose. But I I just knocked myself right out of there, didn't I? You so did. By clicking on that. It's okay. Oh, it's school enrollment. See, if you get knocked off your page, you lose everything. So you want to choose your district um, 
a district of residence. Oops, I bet a big set of capital. So sorry, everyone. I hope you guys are joining in. You're welcome to go ahead and, and enter people yourselves. And you can use your person then to um, try these different functions that we're going to be doing. I don't know about you guys, but I only learn when I do. So yes, can watch somebody else do it. Not going to learn a thing. But if I do it myself, it makes mm -hmm. sense. That's the, yeah, the whole reason we give you these train um, access to the train database. So you can try as well. Six. Okay. Track A, district of residence. Student exempt from fees. <clears throat> um, sometimes at this point in time, you don't know. You know, a lot of times it's by whether they qualify for free or reduced. You can, you know, this is up to you how you want to do this. I have some that that kind of know and they go ahead and mark them not exempt. Or sometimes people say, you know what, until I find out, I'm making them all exempt from all fees. So they don't get assessed anything until we know for sure. This is, we'll show you where you can come back and correct this. It's enrolling them into the Meta High School. Now, this section here is kind of the EMAS fields. Um, some schools want them to, to go ahead and do this. The EMAS coordinator is fine with them filling this in. Other schools say, you know what, leave that piece alone and I'll take care of it as the EMAS coordinator. So that's something you need to work with your district or your, excuse me, your EMAS coordinator about. We're going to go ahead and kind of show you quickly how this works. So it's kind of a situation. So if I open this, is this a student, a district resident being educated by our district? Most times, yes. But you can also do district residents open enrolled out, open enrolled in, court placed. So you would pick the appropriate situation for that student. I'm going to say the most common, district resident educated by the district. As soon as I click that, you're going to notice all of these other areas. These are all the EMIS um, state page information that needs to be filled in. Because I chose district resident educated by the district, it kind of filled in things that that person meeting that situation would need filled in. So it's going to put in my district IRN. It's going to put in most times their English, but you always can change it. Maybe this one isn't an English student. Okay. I can fix those things if I need to for this individual student. But it's putting in the most common answer for these. Grade nine, because I said grade nine. Attendance pattern, if that's my job, I can go ahead and click on this and fill this in as well. Maybe some of these things, this is where, you know, it's kind of district specific as to which things you should fill in and which things your EMAS coordinator or someone else in your building will fill out. Disadvantaged, most times no, most times not homeless. So it's gonna give you all of those most common answers that you can update if you know. District entry date, remember that's the first day their butt is in the seat. We said that at the beginning. Admission reason, you can fill these things in here as well. Percent of times it assumes 100%. So, you know, you, you kind of get the, the gist of what's going on, gives you the most common. You can override it if you need to. All righty, as I scroll on down, we're going to get back to the um, piece that is Core Power School information for family match. We can say enroll without linking or copying, which is what we suggest is the better option. Or you can search for family members to link and copy. What we have found with the new contacts is this section does not work so well anymore because of contacts are not kept in a field any longer. So that's why we say go ahead and enroll without linking. And then down here is the address information for the student. And I'm going to put in a address I know. So I know it will work. 
Okay, you can validate your address. What this does is it looks at Google Maps. So if I click validate, it's going to pull up Google Maps and it's going to validate just out of the box that that's a true address. There, there is a, a house on that address. If you guys have, have it set up, you can set up your school boundaries. And then you would just come down here. Oops, I'm sorry, up here. And you would choose. Yes, you know, it would say maybe be Cyrus City Schools boundaries. And then it would tell you whether or not the student is actually in within your boundaries. So there's some setup that's involved with that. If I think that looks good, that's all I need. I'm going to accept it. And it's going to put my latitude and longitude um, values in there. And then I submit and my student will be enrolled into my school. First thing it's going to do is look for a duplicate. It thinks this could be a duplicate. As you can tell, we already look for duplicates. We have another duplicate. That's how important it is that you don't want to get duplicate students. But it's not the same name, but it matched on the phone number. So it looks at some other criteria. I'm going to say, go ahead and enroll. This is not a duplicate. Confirm. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I can now see if my student is enrolled. That's just the very basic shell to get that student in there. Like I said, five minutes, right? I mean, seriously, mm -hmm. it doesn't take long if yes. you have your information in front of you to, to get a student enrolled. Mm -hmm. and, and now on that checklist, we're about halfway through the first page. We've got the student in there. They are there. And I'm going to go now to demographics. So it's student profile and demographics. Okay, so here is my person. The things I filled in were, you know, was the name, genders, birth dates, but you know, there's still several things that maybe we didn't fill in. Your district may or may not require all of this information, but you know, is there a suffix? Proof of age, where did I get that? Birth certificate, student status. Well, this is an active resident student. Custody, do I, you know, keep track of that? Both parents have custody. Who are they living with? Both parents. All of this data on these pages, you just need to scroll through another district specific thing as to what you have on here that you want to collect. Filled in the home phone when we did it, although I had too many fives. There we go. Um, does he, this, do I want to enter the student's email? Do I have that yet? I can enter it if I do. Cell phones, personal email, neighborhood, if I'm keeping track of that. Proof of address, How? what did I use? Maybe a utility bill. I have the street, if there's an apartment. Mailing, it doesn't fill this in automatically because it could be different. It's not gonna assume it. But I can check the box if it is the same. Mailing address is the same as the home. I just check the box and it will copy it. If you have anything, you may have some customizations entered in here that your district of information they're collecting. You have your additional information. You know, am I collecting the field trip, the handbook, the internet, release of info, guardian alert. Remember guardian alert is if... Um, maybe there's a temporary restraining order and dad can't have contact with the student. If I would put some information in there, that's going to create that alert up here. And then I could also put an expiration if it was a temporary, and maybe it ends today at midnight. Ethnicity, another important area to fill in. This, this also is needed for EMIS reporting. So I can fill those things in. 
and student vehicle. This appears, you know, if the student is of age, I can put that information in there as well. And then any notes I have. Okay, so you're going to want to go through your demographics and fill in the appropriate information there. Okay, demographics. Then we also talk about contacts. So I can come over here to student profile again. And this time I'm going to go to contact management. Remember, contacts are everyone that you need to know about that's associated with this student. Probably parents, step parents, maybe a legal guardian, maybe it's the neighbor because they are the person that um, can pick the student up if they're sick, the babysitter. Any of that information you collect is all considered in the contact management. So first thing I want to do right now, new student, I don't have anyone. I'm going to click add. And first thing we have to do, just like with a student, is search to see if that person's already in there. Oh, X. And I don't have, I can put in as much as I want or don't want. I want to include inactive because maybe they were in there before, but they're not actively associated with anyone anymore. And I don't want to only show access accounts. I always want to see the whole database. Is there anybody in there with this name? I search. They're not there. So I can say, okay, this is a new contact. First name, you're just going to enter their demographic information. Some collect everything on this page. Other districts, I just need some basic information. All righty. Language. Oh, we don't even have English in there, I don't think. Okay. I think it always assumes that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah. So I'm going to say active. This do, this contact is now going to be active. I'm going to check that box. Web account access. So this would be um, if you're going to, you are going to set up that username and that, uh, I guess, set up that parent or guardian's access to the portal. Most times, schools are not setting that up for the parents. And we, and we kind of recommend because it, it kind of inherently has some issues if you're setting them up. We find, at least I have always found, that it works better to let the parents set up their own account. So as a new person I, you know, that I'm entering, I would not set this up. But you could. You could you know, enable it, give them a username and a password. You, know, you would need to know their email. Okay. Students, well, because I was on Sharon when I went to this, add this contact, it already associated with her. But maybe I know, you know what, Sharon just came to us, but her sister is already here at the middle school. I could go in here and, and add students to this contact right from here as well. So I could go out and find that other student. I think I have. Oops, that's not what I wanted. No, there we go. I could come in here and find someone who, another student that may be associated with that. And I could go ahead and check them. And, oops, I didn't check the box. There we go. And then I could put in, all right, this is the neighbor. And add that as well. But you can see, what I'm filling in is kind of the demographics. I don't have all of these boxes filled in because this is kind of, this is the neighbor. It's going to be different than the relationship to Sharon. So once you add this person, you have this contact, you have to come over here and go to actions and set up these things. Okay, this started effective yesterday. They don't have custody. They're not the legal guardian live with, but they can pick them up from school. They are an emergency contact, but they're not receiving mailings. 
and I can say, okay. And that information is filled in. That's my, my direct relationship for this contact with this student. It won't let me fill in this Sharon Ham piece until I su hit submit. Then I can go back in, unfortunately. Add phone. So this is this person's cell phone, and I can put in that number. And can they accept text messaging? Is this their preferred phone? All of these boxes allows you to um, filter when you're looking for contacts. Email address, do I have an email for them? Their home address. So this is the home. Main Street, oops, um, city. And if there's a start date at this address or not, because if you would have a change, you could you can keep history now that they were here and then they moved, you know, so it could have ended on a day and put a new one in. And then I submit. Once I submit, eventually it'll pop up. Then I can come back in and fill in the relationship for the student that I'm enrolling. So this would be the mother and it, um, they started with us yesterday. They have custody. They're the legal guardian, live with them. They can pick them up, their emergency contact and they're gonna receive mailings and I can submit. So I have my contact. My, my relationship with this student and that contact. Any questions on contacts? I know that's kind of a confusing type of a thing. It is the most confusing, I think. Yeah. Just after, it's kind of all over the place, you know, mm -hmm. where you have to go. Just think of it. I mean, it's just like, you know, you, I filled all that information in for Sharon, the new student. Now I have to make sure that the contact's not already there because I don't want duplicate contacts. And then I just have to fill in all that demographic and information for the contact. And then how are they associated with the student? Kind of a same contact, uh, concept, I guess, now as a, as a student. Contacts are almost like that. If you in, while I'm on this page, just because I'm going to say this student is not going to be associated with this contact. So I'm going to say effective yesterday and submit. Well, you can see right away now this this isn't that contact or, or that other student isn't showing on this contacts page. But if I go back to contacts, uh, there we go, people, contacts, search for contacts, and let me pull this person up. Because we're not associated now with the student. I'm actually truly looking at the contacts page. And I bring her up and I choose her. You can see now I only have Sharon associated with me, but you can see I have a plus one. So it keeps a history. That record didn't get deleted when I took that student off of that relationship. I could click show all and it's still, it's gonna bring all of those former students that were associated with that contact up and show that it had an end date. Okay, so always pay attention to these little plus ones. That means there's data there that it's no longer active. All right, so let me go back to Sharon now. No, that's good. She should be still chosen. Nope. Well, drawn staff. Oh, more. on staff. Sorry. Thank you. Like she should be there. That little there drop go. down will get you every time. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> okay, so we talked about contacts. 
So I'm just going to kind of go down the list of the different areas that you're probably going to want to look at. So contacts, next thing on our list is health. So we're going to go to, I chose my student, go to health, emergency medical contacts. Okay, right away it's showing at the top of this page who the contact person is for this. If I need to, I can edit that, any information if I see something's wrong. Um, but the rest of this page, you may or may not have information, medical information. Am I keeping track of consent to tr for treatment? And I could put that information in here. Medical alerts. Is there a medical alert for this student? So maybe they have a peanut allergy. Okay. If I enter information in here, it may or may not have an end date, but it's going to put that alert up here, the medical alert. Do they have any known allergies? Date acknowledged. Do they need an EpiPen? Yep, she uses an EpiPen for this. I could put allergies down here as well. This does not create that red medical, what's it called? I start to say Medusa, but that's not Medusa. It's a Caduceus, uh, isn't it, or something like that? Yeah. Caduceus. So then, so they have a peanut allergy treatment. I can, you know, put as much as I need in here. Food, any food allergies, any reactions? If I want to keep track of the physician, primary physician, all of that information, some of you pull that in because you're collecting it through your third-party vendor. Is, is there any special medical considerations? Is there any medications associated with this student? Is there any notes that the nurses wants to add, or have I added any custom fields down here as well as a district? Some of this stuff you're going to see other places like on the health pages and that. But this emergency medical and context page was kind of designed as a, a quick, oh, the student fell on the playground. They, we need to call an ambulance. I can quickly go to this, see who the contacts are and their numbers to who to contact. I could print this out, send it with the you know ambulance, those types of things. That's why this was also, I think, created to make it a, a easier, easier for you in an emergency situation too. Okay, so that's your health information. Uh, we have one because we didn't know what to call it. Apparently it's just called, it's under more. <laughs> Some more pages here, custom pages. If you have created custom pages, you may have to fill these in. These are definitely district specific. Your district can create their own pages to keep track of data. So there may be information you have to fill in here for your new students. I'm gonna see what is their health custom screen. Oh, something they're keeping track of for, you know, whether they're in complete or not complete or exempt. So a page they've made to keep track of some data. So those are all custom pages up here. And then we, which you, you may or may not need to fill in, student profile. The next thing we're gonna go to is the modify info page. So that's now under student profile, modify info. Few things on here as well. If you're keeping track of family reps, graduation requirement sets, if you're using graduation requirement sets, home room, this is where you can enter in the home rooms, home room teacher, home room short name. This one looks a little different. Yours may not look the same. They have a customization turned on that helps with that. Uh, locker information is entered here. So if you're keeping track of the locker and the locker um, combination, lunch IDs, if you know, you're using something other than student number, part-time student, 
you know, this is just if, if you're wanting to be able to run a search to find your part-time students, percent of time pretty much takes care of that, a lot of that on our um, state page. Uh, current team, current house, current campus. These are used in during the scheduling process. So in this building, they do not have any, but you you may or may not be using that. Track, we talked about track. That's the grouping of students by when they're in attendance. So you can correct that if you need to here. Tracker, we don't use. It doesn't really work with the state of Ohio and the new House Bill 410 laws. But district entry date, Remember, that's the date we said the student was starting. That's their button seat. The first time they were with you, um, and it won't change unless the student leaves and comes back. So it's always going to show the very first day they were with you. Might be, you know, five years from now, but and it'll still show that original date unless they left and came back to you. So you don't want to change that. Uh, district grade level. School entry date, school entry grade level, you may or may not want to use those. Those can be changed, and um, some schools do really like those. Counselor assignment. <clears throat> um, you can assign counselors to your students using this function. It's a new, kind of fairly new to maybe a couple years ago power yeah, school introduced maybe, this maybe that long you yeah. identify the counselor group and then you would say this student this person is a counselor and then they would be added to this list so here are the ones that have been identified in power school for this building as counselors so i could say this person is going to be their counselor okay and then submit All righty, so let me find where I left off. Other, now we're on, that's my modify info page. I can go back to school profile. We have the other info page, which houses other info. <laughs> so yeah, those two pages are just kind of, I call them the generic two pages, right? Yeah. The other info and the modify info. Right. So, yep. Um, Power schools, remember, used all over the world. Okay. Many states report that some of their EMIS information through these pages. Ohio's not. We've created our own Ohio pages. But things that are kind of related, like primary language code, it will show you what you have filled in on the EMIS page here. If they're homeless, those types of things. It will pull some of that information. The information on here that most of our districts may use is this one here. Exclude from class rank. If I have students, um, maybe a foreign exchange student that I don't want to include when I run class rank, if I check this box, they'll be excluded and not included in those numbers. Um, I think Harley uses the example. We have some schools that have some criteria that, <laughs> excuse me, a brand new student can't come in and, you know, be included in class rank right away. They have to be in our school for, you know, the first semester or something like that before they can start being included in the class rank. So some schools, you know, will use it for that. But this is where you can do that. Any student you don't want included, mark them here. Fee exemption status. Remember when we registered the student, entered them in, we put down exempted from all fees. Well, I got the documentation back, the paperwork, and yes, they are going to be assessed. I can come here to this other info page and change that to they are not exempt. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Other text. This is where a lot of alerts appear as well. <laughs> Excuse me. Other alert text. This adds more alerts up here within dates. This is just used for other, whatever your district wants to use it for. We have some report card information on here. Um, if the student's gonna be promoted and to what grade level. So you can fix these things here. <laughs> Harley, you wanna 
talk well. <laughs> it sounds I've gotta, like the, we've both been going I'm on about with a bad to die. cold or some kind of <laughs> stuff going on. So here's that for the meta report card. Here's where you can put down whether they were promoted, you know, what their retention status is, the indicator, the retained, promoted status, you know, there's placed, continuing, all kinds of things that you can actually put in here. Um, I can also uh, do not display the promotion indicator. Maybe the rest of the year I don't want it to show up, right? So I could check that and make sure that's in there. There's ways to do this um, in mass too, by the way. I'm just mentioning this for this particular student. And then maybe I want some message. Do I want a, a message to appear, uh, display a message for the, you know, that hidden report card, something that you want people to know on there. Um, the rest of it really deals with, and we get asked this a lot, here's where a lot of your information, if you're using same goal for as your um, IP for your IPs, so you'll see like that same goal, maybe alert, some information in there. Um, here's an Ohio EMIS alert. So a lot of times your EMIS coordinator will use this to place some kind of alert that she wants to appear for EMIS purposes. Um, maybe some kind of information she needs to enter or something, I don't know, whatever they want to use it for. And then of course, if you are using the attendance, that chair icon, for your attendance alert, you want to put something in, maybe the student's really close to meeting there or has met or is over their House Bill 410 hours. And you don't want to just put information on the House Bill 410 pages. You also want an alert for attendance or whatever else you're going to use that attendance alert for. Um, and make sure when you're using for this one, the expiration date, I, we should say that with any of the alerts that have expiration dates, they do expire as of midnight on that date. So if you put today 1012 um, is the expiration date for the attendance alert, it will expire tonight at midnight. Um, and then if you have felt, or oh, I'm sorry, if you have filled out your at-risk tiles. So if you've went in and filled out all the information um, for at-risk, whether that's at-risk of grades, at-risk of attendance, whatever you've done, the at-risk um, of not graduating, you know, whatever you filled those out. Uh, once you have those out, if you want an alert of some kind to also filter, you know, at risk of graduating, not graduating, you know, that sort of thing, you can do so. Just a few additional alerts that you can fill out. I, you know what, I think this is a good time to say it, and maybe I'm just the person to say it, because I don't mind it. I want to tell you guys something. Sometimes when I get into your databases, you have so many alerts now that it's hard to pay attention to any one of them because you have too many of them. So just don't throw a caution to the wind and say we're going to have 50 alerts and then you'll have that one student that's going to have 50 alerts up there. Just make sure that you're really being cautious and cognizant of how many alerts students have um, set because at, at some point people quit paying attention to the alerts. Okay. All right. Fee transactions. Right. Is that where we're at next? Yes. So I'm just going to say this about the state province. State stuff. I, did you yeah. say that, Laura? So no, I just going to say that's next on our checklist. The stuff that's, you know, set for the state page is probably not always the person doing the enrollments, right? But somebody does, does have to go in um, and make sure that for EMIS, you're doing the right things for EMIS. EMIS is getting set up. And usually EMIS people are very picky, and I don't blame them because they have to do the state reporting about what's getting set up on the um, EMIS record. So if you're really wanting to know everything for the EMIS record, everything that should be set up, my advice is always, of course, get with your EMIS people and get trained on what all is needed for state reporting. So maybe um, if you need, if you are the person doing the EMIS, uh, or at least maybe filling in the information for EMIS, get with your EMIS coordinator. Um, that way you're not putting in the wrong information. We don't want to get our hands smacked and we don't want to get not get funding for kids because we haven't put in correct information. 
There's also fee transactions that need to be, you know, talked about, taken care of. We need to, depending on your building and how you work fees, maybe you do enrollment fees, maybe you do course fees. So as students are enrolled into courses, um, they get course fees. You know, there's all kinds of fees that might be assigned. Make sure that you have an understanding of who in the building takes care of fees and gets fees applied to your student and for what are they getting applied they're getting placed, especially if you're somebody new to enrollments who is also going to be taking care of the fee for that new student. And maybe you just have a sheet that goes to the new the person who is doing fees that says, hey, we have a new person. They haven't been assigned their fees yet. That happens too. So make sure fee transactions. It kind of uh, is pretty basic there because a lot of you really use third party vendors now for your fees. Um, so take care of that piece, piece as well. Like we mentioned, this is just a checklist of all the things, not everything, actually there's others that may potentially need to be filled in. You know, lunch, the free and reduce, somebody in your building handles free and reduce lunch or the lunch people do that as well. They're going to have to take care of all that, you know, if there's something that qualifies. Um, if you're using the brec any breakfast barcodes, if you're using barcodes of any kind, you know, those barcodes are going to have to be created. Um, so somebody's going to have to do the new labels for the barcodes themselves that go on generally a student's badge or some kind of information platform. A big one is just getting kids into courses and programs, right? I mean, we have to make sure that um, students are set up, they have courses. Um, so on that scheduling settings, one of that courses and programs in the schedule, scheduling settings page, you know, just to make sure that this page is important. I don't think people get what this page does. So let, what does this page do? First of all, this page determines at the end of year, when you go through the end of year process, where your students go and what becomes of those students for the next year. So my next year grade, you know, if I'm Laura put me in as a ninth grader, my next year grade is going to be 10 here. I don't have to worry about priority unless I'm going to use um, the automated scheduler on the live side. Um, because this priority is dealing with live side scheduling. Um, so if I am going to use that, I'm going to come back here as a scheduler, as a counselor, and get the priority set up for this student. Schedule this student. You know what? I do want that box checked. Those students are going to have to be scheduled at some point through the school year. And I'm probably going to want them to be allowed to make requests. So I might even want to check the box to allow them to make requests if you have the request uh, portal open, especially. Your year of graduation is important. Um, summer school indicator, you know, none generally. That's a true, if they're going to a true summer school, you have a summer school building created in your district. And this student could potentially be going to summer school. You might want the indicator there. Um, and then if there's any notations you want to note for the summer school admin, you can note those here as well. The second most important field on this screen is the next school indicator. So next year grade, next school indicator, two of the most important ones. So if this student were an eighth grader going to the ninth grade, their next school indicator would be maybe from the middle school, right? But they're going to the high school. So I want my next school indicator to do that. This is the screen, as I mentioned, the end of the year process uses to take care of your students, all your active students, move them into the new buildings they need to be moved in, keep them in the same building and move them to the next grade level. The optional settings that are here are also generally for your counseling staff or anybody who's doing scheduling using automated schedule. Um, that's setting campuses up, houses up, and teams up for the next for the next year for your next school year. Okay, and then courses themselves. You know, I now need to get into my student, and I need to take her to courses and programs. 
in the Modify Course Schedule. This is your Modify Schedule screen. They're calling Modify Course on the Enhanced menu. A few, few name changes, but things are still really familiar when, once you get there um, for all of these things. You know, this is one of my favorite screens of all time in PowerSchool. It is so potentially, um, you know, effective if used right. And it's just huge in what all it can do for you when used correctly. So this is a new student. So if he's at the high school, if he's at the middle school, if he's at the elementary school, and I have requests, if I can make requests for courses. So I'm gonna click on that request. There's two tabs, an enrollment tab that shows the students' enrollments. This is a new student, so we're going to make some requests for that student. So what courses? I'm going to click on View Courses. I'm just going to request, you know, several courses here on this page. By the way, we're getting ready to have counselor skills training. And there's one in Marion and one in Columbus that are live. I would highly recommend that your counselors or whoever's doing scheduling on the live side attend those trainings because some of your people are doing an awful lot of work for no reason. You know, they're they're doing a lot of work. They're working hard instead of working smart. Um, and this screen does so much. So Laura's just going through. You'll have to pardon us. I think she's just given us a, a group of stuff so that we're taking some things. We really go into a lot more depth with this screen during counselor skills training. So here's our, uh, our list of um, what we would like this student to take. That was very easy to do, it took a couple of minutes. Then we're gonna click back to the enrollments and we're gonna use the automated schedule cre screen. It uses those courses that we just requested. So we're gonna use automated schedule. You wanna make sure that, you know, we're doing the right thing for dates and that sort of thing. And, you know, I don't even know that we really looked at that on there, but remember, you know, Laura we're, and I- We're in last year data, so yeah. that's why it's not letting it work. Yeah, so once I click on that automatically schedule the student, it is going to just take those courses. It takes all of that guesswork about whose courses are overfilled, who has the most courses, what the student needs. You know, it's really Filling every take, period. It is. It's really taking a look at things for you and filling every period of the day in the student's schedule by clicking on automated schedule. Um, I would love it if you got, even if you guys want you to attend, if you're not a, a counselor and you're like, you know, I need to know that. I need to know how all that screen works. Please attend those sessions because, of course, we'll be in a current year and be working on that. So we want to make sure you mm -hmm. come. So that would be how to quite easily schedule a student into courses. You know, there's still the old way. You could still just manually schedule them course by course or schedule them into hopefully your their homeroom at an elementary, right? And maybe you have dependent sections, so they get scheduled into a homeroom and it schedules them into everything else. So that's the reason you want dependent sections set up. So Laura clicked on manually schedule for this particular student, and we're now looking at the manually schedule student screen. What it does is actually takes a look at everything that's available to the student. Um, you know, what's, what does he already have scheduled? What did I have this student into? And honestly, one of the best here is what sections are full? What can I not get this student into? It's gonna appear in red. Um, if there are multiple sections, multiple sections, it lets you know that there's multiple sections. The little numbers that appear out to the left of the boxes on manually schedule are the multiple sections. Now. It's going to recommend one first. So the one you put it into, when you click the box, you don't always get the choice of which of those two. What it's going to do is say, uh, you know, maybe I have my max enrollment set at 25. And it's going to see that Mr. Jones only has 15 kids, but Miss Smith has 20 kids in her class. 
So it's going to try to put them in the least field. You know, it's very intuitive and tries to do the best thing for the, the teachers as well as the students. You can override it manually if you need to, if you don't want it to go into that section as well. But that's honestly one of the best screens in power school now for those who have to do um, scheduling on the live side. Just remember your dates. Remember those darn dates because really easy to get people enrolled in the wrong button seat date, as well as if I need to drop courses for any reason, it's really um, a thought process, right, as to what date I want to transfer them out of that course or drop that course. Remember, it's not their last day in the course, it's the day after the last day in the course, because you still want them to get grades for that last day, that last day. So my button seat date is not always, it's good, generally speaking, for my enrollments and my enrollment dates, but I have to really watch for my transfer, or my leave dates here, okay, on this screen. What else, Laura? Tora, are we ready to transfer out? Well, I just, I did, I was making sure it wasn't on mute. Yeah, one other thing, we talked in the beginning about making sure you didn't have duplicate students yeah. and that the student, you know, may already be in there. So I had kind of went to school enrollment and enroll new student. And we had talked, we actually really truly enrolled a new one, but we kind of touched base on it a little bit to making sure the student wasn't already in your system and they, you know, just needed to be re-enrolled. So we're going to pretend that Adam Lee, I can see he was transferred out. He's in the high school. He's coming back. This is nice because right on this page, I can go to functions and it takes me right to the page to re-enroll him. If, you know, if he, if he wasn't there, I could always search for him and then go to the functions page to find it. But basically he's, he's already in the system. I just need to come to re-enroll. He's already there. I'm going to put my re well, it's my date, first date, he's there, just like the other, you know, if you're enrolling them as a new student, okay, he's coming back to us from another public school, I could put that in there, then that's always a good, good thing to do. Um, came from Marion City Schools. Okay. And full-time equivalency, once again, still needs to be filled in. What grade is he going to be in? What track? And then my district of residence. And do I want to restore class enrollments? This is used if the student was with you at the beginning of the school year. They moved away, was gone for a month or two, came back. Do you want to put them back in those same classes they were in when they were with you at the beginning of the year? You would say yes. A lot of times that doesn't always work because maybe the classes have been filled or, you know, other things have happened. So you can also choose no and then manually schedule them into the courses you want them in. And submit. So then now the student, oh, I chose a course. I chose a date that was not in session. <laughs> So, and I think that's going to be my issue because I'm in last year. Yeah. So, that's how you um, do it. but yeah, that's how you re-enroll them. Okay. I think we are ready for the transfers. <laughs> let's take about a five minute break, everybody. You, I, I, I could use a restroom break. So let's do five minutes. It's uh one forty-two. So one forty-seven. we'll be back and get started again. Yes, and I just started recording. Okie dokie. You want to talk about transfers? You feel like talking about transfers? I think so. I think okay. so. All right. <laughs> okay. So now we're kind of at the, the other end of the spectrum, and we have our students who are leaving us. So transferring students out. So um, first thing we're going to do is find our student. So I have Ian Adams chosen. Okay, and he's he's leaving us 
He's going to another school, moved away. So I'm going to go to school enrollment. And this time I'm going to transfer the student out of school. Pretty easy page, but very important. Some of the things that you have on this page. First thing, Ian, who's being transferred out, transfer comment. We recommend that you put in where this student went. I can type right there, move to Marion. And you can put in more information, you know, if you want to put the actual school and the address or any of that information. It's always good to just kind of put those entry and, and transfer out comments because of the history. When you go back, you can kind of see what they did. They went here, then they came back and, and those types of things. Date of transfer, really important, should be the day after the la or the student's last day in class. Dates drive so much in power school, and it's important that you put the proper dates in. So if the student is leaving us today, he was in class yesterday, I need to make sure he was still active yesterday. So I'm not going to put yesterday's date in power school. He was there. He needed the teacher to be able to enter assignments. The teacher needed to take attendance. So I wouldn't put that day. Today was the day he's no longer with us. So it was the day after the last day of class. He was there on the 11th in class. He's not there today on the 12th. So that's the day I would put in there. The day after their last day in class. Um, in this one, because we're using last year, I'm going to put in a date from last year. Just... So we get some proper data, okay? Date of transfer for this student was actually last year, May 1st. Exit code, okay? So most times it's a 41. They're going to another Ohio school district, but not always. You know, you'll need to know what your exit code is. And do I want to transfer him out of programs? Most times we don't recommend that, especially if it's special ed, because if they come back, you don't want that program to have been ended. But you can, you know, it's up to you. Um, withdrawn to IRN, an important state field. If they're moving to another district, you have to report what district they're going to. Well, I don't know what Marion's IRN is. I can do district list, and I can search for it. So uh, it's Marion City is where he's going. So I just choose it and it fills it in for me. Check here if students intend to enroll in school during the next year. Do not check that box. If I check that box and this student had made requests for next year, it's going to leave those requests and it's going to schedule that student into those courses next year, even though they're not coming back. If they're coming back, it's better just to go back in and re-enter their requests if they happen to come back. So this just causes a lot of problems when people check that box. Harley, you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's good. You do good. Yeah. So... This is the piece that we have so many people miss. So if I, I put down 5123, this little yellow box down here is so important and it will save you a lot of headaches. This says, notice there are two attendance records for the current student listed below and the number of records per date. Okay, so... Johnny left on 5-1, but he didn't tell us, or who Ian, he didn't tell us he was leaving. So the teachers started marking him absent. We were marking him absent for daily attendance. And then we found out from, the, from Marion that he came to them. So we have this attendance sitting out there. 
and I know you all have that have been around a while have experienced this where it won't let you withdraw a student because they have attendance records and you don't want to orphan it. Pay attention down here. It says there's records. I can check this box and it will delete those and allow me to withdraw this student. Oh my I gosh, I hope every last one of you were listening <laughs> yes. to that because that will save yourself so much time. Oh, yes. We get so many cases where people are not checking that box and it won't let me withdraw that student. Right. Or even worse, if you notice, we didn't withdraw him from his classes. This process takes care of that. We have a lot of people that will go to, before they try to transfer him out of school, they'll go to that student's schedule and drop them from all the courses. Well, then that orphans attendance and you can't get it to it any longer because the student has been withdrawn from the classes and then this button doesn't appear. So don't withdraw them from classes before you transfer them out of school. Let the transfer out of school process withdraw them from classes. It's going to withdraw them on that same date you enter up here. If they have attendance, make sure you're looking down here for this yellow box. Don't just fill this in and be done with it. Look down here. If there are records, you probably want to delete them so that you can withdraw them. And then I can go ahead and submit. And the student will be withdrawn effective that day and their attendance will be deleted. Confirm. And the student is transferred out. Oh, okay. So he's transferred out. I have to go back to him this way. And if I look at, let's say, his demographics. Some of you have this up here, so I can see that now he is transferred out. Another important, I mean, a, a field that you guys may want to remind yourselves of is this um, enrollment history. In, in the enhanced version, it's called enroll enrollment history, but we kind of know and love it as transfer info. <laughs> but so this is the new title for this page. And this is where I said, it's nice to put that history in there. So if they were coming and going, I can see, oh, they came here on this day from Marion, then they moved back to Marion and then they came back. So that's why these exit comments are nice as well. And I can see he withdrew, he was here from start of the year, withdrew on May 5th or May 1st, 41 code. And he's no longer active. Okay. That's the straightforward. A student left you, went to another school. We you can also, also look to see if he's in, in courses still, right, Laura? I could also oh, look yeah, to see sure. if, that, if that's happening as well. Good idea. And I go to courses and programs. And I go to his list schedule, list view schedule. And, oh, these are for this year. Yeah, just, yeah. Where is his course registrations, right? That's my, my old all enrollments. Yeah. And I can see it withdrew him from all of those courses he was in on May 1st as part of the transfer out of school process. Those are a few of the names they've changed in the enhanced menu mm -hmm. that I'm really struggling with. It's all in What's funny, and transfer info. I think I hate saying What's that. What's kind of funny true. is if you're searching for it, you go to courses and programs and it's called course registrations. But when you get to the page, it's still called all, enrollments. all enrollments, I know. <laughs> so I yeah, they, oh, they well. still, I think have a few little tweaks. They're going to probably will be working on. Okay, that's a student that is leaving you, moving to another district. Now, we also have times when if you're a school that has multiple buildings, multiple high schools, multiple elementaries, you know, we see that happen here a lot. Um, I live on one side of the town and I go to West Elementary, but I move now to the other side of town. So the the family wants to switch to the elementary that's right next to their house. You know, I can walk right there. 
So you guys need to move them from one building to another. So that in that case, let me just go to, we're going to go to elementary two. And I'm going to find a little student. You find your student. Go to the same place, school enrollment, and transfer out of school. People get confused about this because well, they're not transferring out of school, but they, they are transferring out of this building. So think of it that way. I have to break enrollment with the building I'm currently in. And then that way I can go to another building and be re-enrolled. So it's not always just leaving the district. It's leaving an individual school building to move to another. So I have my student. Hey, that can be can... from a brick and mortar building to your uh, virtual academies too. Right, right. You're if using you have that same yeah. process, mm -hmm. right? Elementary, she's moving to elementary four. Okay, what date? Once again, it's the last day after their, their, or it's the day after their last day in class. Okay, anytime you're withdrawing a student, um, dropping them from a class, when they're leaving those things, it's the day after their last day in class. So it is today. She was in class yesterday. Starting today, she's going to be at the other elementary exit code. In this situation, because she's not leaving our district, she's staying within our district, just moving within it. We're going to use this one. Not applicable, default student, did not withdraw, and was not truant. Okay? That's just an inter-district transfer. We don't have to worry about withdrawn to IRN because they're not leaving us. We're not going to check if the school intends to enroll next year. Notice this. In this case, this student didn't have attendance records after today's date, so they're okay. You know what? I'm going to have to use a past date because we're not in this year. So I'm going to say on the 16th. God love using and the submit. training databases sometimes. I know. I know. So submit. So I'm breaking the enrollment with elementary school, too, because... She's not going to be attending this school anymore. So that's step one of the process of moving a student. Let me bring her back up. And now I need to go to school enrollment and say transfer to another school. Because she's still in school two as a transferred out student. So I have to say, okay, she's going to be moving to school four. Please move her over there and submit. Now she's no longer going to show up in this building because she's she's not inactive and she's not active there. We've just now moved her to school four. So elementary school four person can come in in their building and find her. Oh, what was her last name? Madison? You know I what? Didn't I didn't, down. I'm horrible. Yes, I think so. It's either her first name or her last name. Let's try it. <laughs> okay, that's a no. All right. Just do it on anybody. Yeah, we're going to find a student. Find that student we just transferred over there. Okay. She's now appearing in this building, and I can go back to school enrollment and re-enroll her into school. Okay. The date is going to be the same day as her transfer out from the other building, because remember, that is the day after her last day in class, which happens to be the first day she's in my building. So that date will match her transfer out. Entry code. She's not coming from another school or anything. She's going to be number seven, not newly enrolled in this school district. It's just an inner transfer. And I can put entry. And 
and my full-time equivalency. What grade level is she going to be in? What track? What's her district of residence? And no, I don't want to restore class enrollments because she wasn't there before. And submit. And now she's now active in this building. And I'm going to go through kind of that same checklist as a new student because I may have things I need to fix. I might have to fix her address. I might have to, you know, but most of it probably is going to be pretty accurate, probably the same contacts, but I'm going to have to enroll her into classes, you know, so it's a little, some of those things you're going to have to revisit when you re-enroll a student, even when they're moving from one school to another. You know, just a, maybe a little advice here when you're dealing with enrollments and transfers and all this and all that piece is that a lot of you are having to go in and archive many, many students because that's the new process, you know, to archive those duplicate students. And that's ridiculous when a, honestly, if you were just, if someone, whoever that person is, was following the, the correct steps to do your transfers and to do your enrollment. So I think mm -hmm. that's just critical that you're checking to make sure there's not always already duplicate students in, in the building and that you're doing the correct, especially transfer out process, more mm -hmm. importantly. Yeah. And, and you <laughs> notice we had a couple different reminders where it searched to see if there was a duplicate. It did. So. Let's talk about remote enrollment too, Laura. Okay. Since we're kind of on sure. one of those kiddos. All righty, so let me, we'll just go ahead and since Alexa's back in here and I need to do her schedule. So I'm going to go to courses and programs and course registration. And I need to now put a schedule on Alexa for my elementary. Oops, I must've chose the wrong thing. Not cool. Modify course schedule. Is that what I'm, thank you. Nope, no problem. <laughs> I knew it was close there. It's that All right. Menu, so, <laughs> right. So in this case, in an elementary, we're in an elementary. I'm going to just show you real quickly something you can, we, we talked a little bit about is those dependent sections. So I could come in here and let's just say all, and I know she's going to go into this kindergarten class so I can find this kindergarten. Well, I'm going to, of course, there it is. There you go. Kindergarten homeroom. All right. She's going to go into Miss Foose's kindergarten. I can just choose this. And because we put dependent sections on, anyone that goes in Mrs. Foose's class is going to have all of these classes attached to them. So it automatically enrolled her into those classes because the dependent, it's an easy button. It says if you if she's in this class, enroll them into these other classes. That's that pack mentality. This group of students stays together all day. You can do that in an elementary. Okay, so that's that's the case of enrolling them with dependent sections. But we were talking about remote enrolling a student. So maybe she's going to the middle school Oh, as a kindergartner, she's really intelligent. She's going to the middle school to take a class. Okay, so I can go to courses and programs, remote and summer school registration. Where we see this the most is at that middle school. I'm a eighth grader and I'm going to the high school and taking algebra. Okay, that's how you do that. The student stays in the middle school or in this case, the elementary and then we do a remote enroll. So where's the class being held? Well, she's gonna go to the intermediate building for this class. And we're messed up because of the years. Or maybe she's just going over to another elementary, whatever the case may be. You're gonna say, what building is she gonna go take courses? I can type in that course name and choose it, she's gonna go first grade math over there. 
And then if there were sections, it would show the sections and you would choose which section she will, will be attending and what date is she starting. Okay, and submit. And it's going to keep her in her building, her original building, but she's now going to have a class that's being held at another building showing up on her schedule. And she'll be on that teacher at that other building's list where they can do attendance, they can do assignments and grading. Like I said, most, we see this a lot at middle schools going to the high school. But we've seen elementary now going to the high school oh, yeah. and middle school too to take algebra mm -hmm. and all different kinds of math courses. Yeah. So, yep. Still well, doing remote. We, I just recently helped a, a, a school that um, they have their honors accelerated elementary all in one building in the afternoon. So, you know, their students at the the one elementary, but then they go over to the other building in the afternoon to take that accelerated math or type of a thing. So I am seeing in this more. Okay, yeah, so we I have a question. I think it's good, especially when you're, right, when you're storing grades, because it does store, it shows the other grade on the report card, does all of that. So just kind of a good way to work that. Okay, so we I have a question. A question. Hmm. Um, she asked, Stephanie asked, why is the transfer out of school screen different if you do it from the start page? Is that function primarily to be used for those scheduled auto transfers? It can um, be used for, for both. It's it's just, a, it does look mm -hmm. different, Stephanie. It always has. I've always complained about it because of that. I think people get confused when they go and they pick their students and then they go down to the function menu. Um, and try to transfer them out or try to, you know, do so anything from that page. It does look a little different. It does give you a different option, too, of being able to just to move them right on that it, day. to. It the, does. Which is very, what we've been using it this year. I just wanted to make sure that we were doing it right. because You're we, fine. I guess yeah. I'm not exactly sure what you're seeing, if I can get so, to it. How did you get to it? Okay, so if you go to the start page and then and the group functions, there is a, I think it, Although here with the enhanced menu, it says uh, group mass, or sorry, mass um, transfer out of school, I think is what it is. But Songs further down, Laura. So this is, are you talking about doing this for a single student or a group we, of students? Well, we, we it depends. It depends on if we have siblings. Sometimes siblings will, I'll just do mass because they're all going to the same school. Um, but we've been doing this this year too, for those that we know are coming up. Um, but are currently active in another in one school, so we can do we can schedule their transfer ahead of time. But um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm just wondering. I'm hoping. I'm pretty sure we're doing it right. But I just kind of like I didn't know if there yeah, was yeah. Where it's different is there where that it's transferring mm -hmm. to. So it's one step rather than two steps. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. You're, you're, I get do, what you're, you're doing the transfer here, plus you're yeah. doing the transfer mm -hmm. to. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then your date you know, the auto would be if your date is a future date. Right. So then too, as well, it's tough just trying to tell the, the new school to be like, you can't, they're not active when they, when they come into the school that they're going to be inactive. It's just, so we have to always to remember to go into the new school and re-enroll them. But yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't know if we were, I wanted to make sure we were doing it right. Yeah, you this are. would work as you well. Are. But you know, when you're doing multiples, this isn't used a lot because, you know, you don't have lots of multiples leaving at one time like that, but it yeah. definitely, I could see but that with siblings you have, and things. Especially if they're all in one building, that yeah. makes sense. For sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thanks. Welcome. Uh -huh. All righty. Anything else? Great question. We appreciate you guys. We appreciate yes. all that you do. You will never know how much we appreciate you. So if you have questions in the meantime, if anything comes up, um, please let us know. Don't hesitate to put in a case and say, hey, I was in, you know, uh, enrollment class and something's come up and I want to know this now. We'll be happy mm -hmm. to help you with it. it you know, we want to yeah. continue, continue the learning, continue working smart, not hard. Okay. Right. Process. Right. So if anything comes up, let us know. And we thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Thank you, ladies. Welcome. You're welcome.